All right, hi everyone. Um, my name is Brandon, I'm from IBM Research, and today I'm going to talk to you about Nabla containers, um, a new approach to container isolation. Um, so for those that are curious why it's called Nabla, um, this symbol over here is a Nabla symbol. And as you see in the latest slide, um, our containers look like that. Um, and I would say be very careful when you Google search Nabla. Um, if you miss a letter, you may get something very different. Um, all right, so the conventional knowledge today is containers are not well isolated, they're not secure, right? Um, if I say I'm going to run multi-tenant containers, people say no way. But VMs, they're like, okay, you know, we'll do that. Um, so this brings about a few questions, you know, what exactly does isolation mean? Um, we want to answer this and then we want to go on to see why do people consider VMs um, securely isolated, but containers not, right? Uh, and once we have the answer to that, then we can go on to answer the question, how do we improve container isolation? So in this talk, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through a few things. I'm going to start with the threat model, the specific threat model we are looking at, uh, how we are quantifying isolation, uh, and how we can increase isolation by reducing surface reduction. I'll then talk about our approach Nabla, give you a short demo, and um, talk a little bit about the measurements that we are doing as well as uh, spend a little time on VMs versus containers. All right, so what does it mean to be isolated? So let's, let's define this first. Um, let's say isolation is the ability that one container or workload should not be able to access the data or the secrets of a co-located container or workload. So in this case, uh, in this diagram over here, we have service A, our super secret service A. And if I have another container on my host, this um, container should not be able to access the secret in the other container. All right. So why is this important? Um, consider the scenario where um, I have my, my service A over here that's gone through VA analysis, static analysis. You know, this is military grade applications, unhackable, right? And then I so happen to have this legacy 10 year old application that has 2000 vulnerabilities in it, right? If this container gets compromised and I can do something like we call a horizontal attack, then all that vulnerability analysis, all the effort to make this service super secure is wasted. All right. Um, another scenario for this is um, being a cloud um, provider like IBM. This is a big thing we face with multi-tenancy. All right. So what is the state of container isolation today? So what exactly are containers? Containers are namespace processes, right? Um, so that's good. Namespacing means that data should be segregated, everyone should have their own namespace, right? Um, so that's great in that respect, but being namespace processes also mean they are processes. And whatever CVEs, whatever vulnerability or privilege escalation exploits that can be done on processes can also be done on containers, right? So if we consider an attack scenario where we want to get the secret, we can imagine that an attacker may first compromise uh, a shared privilege component, the kernel, and from this perform some kind of trampoline attack to the container it wants to reach, right? Um, so recent CVEs in 2018, uh, the most recent ones is September, I think. Um, back two years ago, Dirty Cow was a huge one. Uh, very popular, but if you go and look at the CVE database, there are enough of these uh, exploits that come up that we should be worried about. So let's take a quick look at what we're up against, right? Let's uh, take a look at Dirty Cow. Um, here's an exploit sketch. So it does MAP, a page. It creates a thread that does a bunch of M advice syscalls. It then does a bunch of read and write to the prop file system. And what it's trying to do here is the interaction here is trying to um, create a race condition and trigger a vulnerability. Right. So let's take a deeper look and see what's happening. So in this more detailed model, 
uh, we can look at the kernel and say that it's no longer a black box, right? All we have in the kernel are kernel functions. The kernel is just code, right? So in this case, we have um, identified every kernel function as a box. And we can say that um, if we have vulnerabilities in this kernel, they exist in the function. So uh, we can signify the red boxes with, by kernel functions with vulnerabilities. So the idea is that in the exploit, whenever you did something like M advice, uh, M map, uh, basically what was happening was you were invoking a series of kernel functions. And if you are able to activate the right kernel functions to exercise the code sequences, uh, you may be able to trigger a bug. So our hypothesis is that if we restrict the number of syscalls possible, the interface to the kernel, uh, we basically are reducing the amount of boxes, kernel functions being reached. And because of that, there will be potentially less vulnerabilities, and with less vulnerabilities, um, less exploits will be possible. So to answer the question you already have in your mind, uh, hasn't this already been done? And yes, the answer is SecCom, right? Uh, we all know what SecCom is, it's basically a quite distinct policy. Uh, the idea is you can set a SecCom policy that says, I want to block certain syscalls, and when, as an application, I'm talking to the kernel, I say, um, give, me, give me a new page, and he's like, no. All right, so Docker has done this. Um, they, Docker has created the default SecCom policy. Um, so what our updated um, thing looks like is that we have the SecCom policy, and you know, for default, the syscalls that Docker blocks by default uh, will not be accessible. So what we can imagine here is that now the grayed out boxes are the, the kernel functions which are no longer accessible, right? So they, we can kind of imagine that these disappear from the kernel, right? So maybe some red boxes, some blue boxes disappear. Um, the problem with SecCom though is that it's really hard to create a SecCom policy. Um, what people have been doing is to try to create generic SecCom policies like Docker. But the problem is to create a second policy that is generic enough for most applications, you end up allowing a ton of things and you don't really get that much security from it. Um, there's a bit of work being done with uh, syscall profiling. So this is some work, um, I think Twistlock and Aqua Security have been doing this. It's uh, basically running some dynamic analysis and figuring out what syscalls are being used and basically from that create a heuristic profile, right? Oh, all right. So come in NABLA. So what is NABLA? So NABLA is a deterministic and generic second policy. Um, basically, we are able to create a second policy for generic applications with only seven system calls. So how do, we, how do we do this? Magic. Um, what we're using is a technique called library OS techniques. Um, so this really comes from um, a lot of work in the unit kernels. Uh, so the idea here is that, um, let's look at the functions in the kernel. For example, the TCP IP stack, right? What's in the TCP IP stack is a bunch of sliding windows, a bunch of algorithms on you know, how my window should slide and all that. So the question is, why does the sliding window implementation have to be in the kernel? You know, it's just a bunch of math. And what the library OS technique we're doing is using the OS technique, what, what is happening is that we're taking all this code and then we are bringing it up to user space, right? So in this sense, you can imagine that now my TCP IP stack, instead of being the kernel, is being put in something like libc, right? So if I make a socket call, I'm no longer directly talking to the kernel, I'm doing some work in user space, and then talking to the kernel when I absolutely have to, for example, to talk to hardware. So just to um, talk briefly about what exactly we're using. Um, so this is taking a lot of ideas from Unit kernels. Um, we're using a lot of tools and techniques from Solo5 and Rampant community. Um, 
There's a lot of details in this. Basically what we've done is we've taken unit kernels and put them into processes. So you get the benefits of a lot of the, um, the, proce the process benefits, you know, high memory density, um, fast boot up times. And there's quite a lot of detail to this, but we, we have a paper, unit kernels as processes that was in SOCC this year. So if you want to really dig into the details, you can take a look at that. So let's talk about NABA in terms of Kubernetes and container ecosystem, right? Um, so currently we have this limitation that um, an application has to go through a custom build process to create something called a NABA binary, right? Um, so our build process is that we go through this build process which involves RunPrun and Solo 5, and this creates a NABA binary. Now, this is something that we are working on to remove. Um, this is kind of, the, the, the reason for this is due to some artifacts in um, unit kernels, but we believe that, that we should be able to remove this need for build process. Um, and then of course, right now, because we have a Nava binary, uh, we have developed a Kubernetes runtime, run NC, which is a OCI runtime. And basically what this does is it loads the Nava um, images and enforces the, setcom, the seven syscall setcom policy. All right, so demo time. So what I'm gonna look at is we have this repository called Nava Demo Apps. This is where we keep a uh, bunch of applications that we've created. Um, so I have this cloned over here in my VM. Um, so the one that we're going to look at today is the Node Express. So just to go in the application to see what we have, a very simple, a very simple application. Basically, if we look at this, the package of JSON and the app. Uh, basically, if you talk to the root, you get Nabla. Um, so what we're going to do in this demo is we're going to create a new. Think over here, and we're going to say, you know, hello from Dabla based on the KubeCon path. All right, so the question now is how do we build it? Okay, so we're going to look at both building it from the perspective of building a regular Node.js application and then building a Nava application, right? So let's first look at the regular Node.js application. So pretty standard. Um, from the node image, uh, we are basically copy, copying our application over and the package over, uh, the JSON, package of JSON over. We're running an NPM install, and then we're basically running node. So now let's look at the Nabla Docker file. Um, as you can see, it pretty much stays uh, mostly the same, except we have added this additional stage build. Um, so what we're saying here is from this image called Nabla Containers Nabla Node Base. Um, basically what this base image has, it has um, the copy of the node Nabla binary that we've created. Uh, so very simply, we basically copy all the JS files over that's necessary for the application to run and we tell it to run the application by setting the command. Now I'm gonna cheat a bit by not building the application now because I tried building it just now and it timed out on getting the uh, NPM install. So you're gonna just have to take my word or you can download the repository and check it out. Um, but basically I created two images. Um, one is called um, Legacy and one is called Nabla. So let's let's look at deploying it on Kubernetes, right? So this is a cluster that I have now, uh, no pods currently running, um, and so the setup here is we have um, this is a local Kubernetes cluster on my VM, and this is using ContainerD as a runtime, and we are using the CRI plugin for untrusted workloads. So let's first look at the deployment of a regular container. All right. So fairly straightforward, you know, we just have the image over here. 
which is set as the legacy image. Right? And now let's look at what the diff of an ABLA image would look like. So, And I'm going to remove the name because the name is just different. I don't want to get distracted by that. So the, the changes are fairly straightforward. Uh, one, we're adding the annotation over here for the untrusted workload. So what um, this annotation does is it's telling, um, this gets passed on from Kubernetes to ContainerD and tells it that use the untrusted workload that's currently configured. So um, the container D that we're running is configured with run NC being um, the workload, um, the runtime for untrusted workload. And over here, we've built um, our separate Nava image based on the Docker file that I showed earlier. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to create these two deployments. All right. So we can see that I have both my, my pods running, both the legacy and the Napa application. Um, and if I look at the logs here, you know, I see regular container, right? This is what I should see. And let's look at the logs of the Napa container. All right, there's a lot of stuff going on over here. So, okay. So we have, uh, over here, we see the Solo5 um, banner, some debug information, which is, is what we're printing out. And we can see over here um, some information of Rampran that's being initialized. So this is the library OS that um, uh, we're using. And basically, after, after all the initialization um, and second policies, we have the application running. And because it's saying listening on port 8080, it's, it, it proves that it's the, it's the same app, right? Um, so what, what we're going to do now is we're just going to test out that they're working. Let's get the pods. I have an issue finding my cursor. Okay. So this is on the same machine. I'm going to call. Um, 8080 and kubecon, right? So this is hello from legacy container. And if I do the one for the Napa container, which is dot 40, I'll see hello from the Napa container, right? But this is weird, oops, sorry. 140. Yeah. But this isn't really interesting because it doesn't really show us much, right? It just shows that Nabla is running the same application as um, the regular container. So let's take a look at what our claims are that we are actually reducing the tag surface. So what I'm going to do in this window is I'm going to first figure out what processes are actually being run. Right. So I have two processes here. One of them is the regular Node.js application, right? And one of it is the Nabla, uh, the Nabla binary being run. Okay, Nabla run is our loader that run and see runs. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to do an S trace. So what S trace is doing is it basically attaches to the oops pseudo. So what Ashtrace is doing is it's attaching the process and basically keeping track of all the syscalls that are being invoked. And uh, dash C basically waits um, and collects the, heuris the, the information and then prints a histogram after I terminate it. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna say while well, true to <coughs> call
Oh shit, okay. <laughs> um, I'm gonna restart it. Alright. So what we see here is uh, the, the syscalls that uh, are being run. So what, what really is interesting to us is the number of lines that are over here. So the number of unique syscalls being invoked. All right. So over here we can see there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine or ten. I don't know whether I can count, right? It's uh, nine or ten syscalls being invoked. And we can see like, for example, over here, M advice. Remember, we saw that in Dirty Cow. All right. This syscall is possible. Um, even in the most, um, if you create a set policy for Node.js, M advice will still be needed. So you will still have to allow that. So now let's look at this um, for Nabla. And do the same thing except with the Nabla container. And we can see that, you know, we only use three syscalls compared to 10 of the regular process, you know, people write and read. Can't possibly be malicious, right? Um, there's more to that, but I won't go into details right now. <laughs> um, all right, so, so we've seen basically that um, based on the ashtrays, we are getting a, a smaller syscall profile at least, right? Um, which is great. That means less syscall in this case, if we didn't allow M advice, then if an attacker was able to get into this container, they would not be able to perform the dirty cow attack. All right, so, so what, what do we see? Oops. Uh, all right, so, so what did we see um, just now? What we saw was the graph on the left. So what we were doing was we were performing an S trace, which is basically looking at how many syscalls were performed at this level. Okay. So what we saw was Node Express, we had three syscalls versus uh, somewhere around 8 and 10 syscalls. Um, we have this running on Redis and Python Tornado, a web server. So Redis is the um, uh, in-memory key value store. Python Tornado is a web server. And we see very similar results in the number of syscall reductions. But you can argue, you know, um, syscalls don't really mean anything because, you know, a read or write, you know, based on the file descriptor, you can basically read and write multiple different things. So you can classify them as different functionality. Uh, so what we did was we did a more in-depth analysis. So what we did was an F-trace. So what F-trace is doing um, is a fairly expensive operation. Um, what it does is it basically, tr every kernel function that is being invoked in the kernel, um, we are basically logging in. And so what we're doing here is the exact same analysis. Uh, we're basically recording the number of unique kernel functions being invoked, and this is the graph that we have. So you can see that um, this idea that reducing the number of syscall translates to less code being touched in the kernel. Right. So we did this with uh, a few other runtimes, um, and one of the interesting things we noticed was um, from this graph, and I, I have more, um, I have another graph that compares GVisor and stuff, and Kata containers and Docker um, on throughput and the F-trace matrix, but if you're interested, let me know, and then I can show it later. So the, the interesting thing from this was that we saw that, look, we found that Nava containers, based on our matrix, was doing a little bit better than Kata containers. So, being research, we ask ourselves the question, you know, what does this mean for isolation, especially VMs? Does, is, what's, have we found the, the, the magic secret sauce of how VMs do isolation? So 
um, we spent a couple of months to kind of dig, dig into this problem and to really understand um, why were we seeing similar or better results compared to VMs. And so we wrote this paper called Say Goodbye to Virtualization for a Safer Cloud. This was in Usenix Hot Cloud. And um, the main idea of this talk was we, we basically analyzed um, virtualization, uh, virtualization as a technology, VT, and said that if you did the same thing on VT and as a regular process, um, really, what, what are you getting from that? Okay. Um, this in itself can be a talk on its own, so I'm just going to summarize like, uh, the conclusions that we, we came to, as well as some of the feedback we got from the academic community. Um, so a few things were, um, in the paper, we, we compared against KVM, because it was something that was accessible to us, especially in the unit kind of world. Um, and the question was, this is a fairly um, implementation-specific comparison. You know? um, maybe we should look into other hypervisors and see how that performs with that. Um, the other big question that people brought up was, um, you know, the very popular hardware attacks, right? Spectre, Meltdown, um, lately, you know, hyper-threading side channels and things like that. And yes, our, our model doesn't include all these things. Um, which brings us to the last point, which is other metrics. So we, we want to gather feedback from the community and all the other container isolation groups to kind of come together and say, how do we really say what is isolation and how do we measure it? We, we know we are not covering everything because we don't cover this point, right? Um, so we are currently still ongoing research into seeing what exactly, what other things of isolation, you know, data, uh, data coverage and things like that. So what's next? Um, currently the team, uh, we have about three, originally three, now we have four people. Uh, we want to get more people looking at this and thinking about this. Um, there's quite a bit of development work still needed to be done in run and see our runtime as well as you know supporting other languages. Uh, most recently we we were able to support Golang. Um, so first of all, you know, the need to remove uh, the build process so that you don't have to create a separate container for Nabla. You can just launch a regular container and have Nabla kind of transparently be put in. Um, the second, like I said, you know, more language support. Um, and the second thing is, uh, like I mentioned earlier, we, we are also very ac academic driven, so we want to also um, try and get more feedback on what exactly isolation is. We want to hear, um, you know, wh what, are, what are the models of isolation that people look at and how they, they see it and whether it fits into this model, whether we can, you know, improve the model to be more holistic. All right, so thank you. And uh, that's all I had for today's talk. Um, we still have some time, so I think if you want, I can show you a, a few more details or you have specific questions. Um, do visit our site, navacontainers.github.io, um, and also take a look at our, our runtime and contribute code if you can. Thank you. Hey, Bren, I have a hey. question about performance. So every layer you introduce between uh, your application and the kernel obviously adds um, some extra code that needs to be executed. How much slower is this than running like <laughs> on bare kernel? Okay, so there's two parts of your question. I'm gonna answer the first part first, which is um, doing this, you're running extra code. Um, so if you look back into unit kernels, um, there was actually a performance impetus of doing this library OS technique. And one of it was actually, you were doing less traps to the kernel. So some people actually saw performance increases when they use a library operating system, right? Um, 
since we talked about performance, uh, so this is the performance numbers that we got. Um, so this is the Redis benchmark, and this is the Python Tornado and the Node Express. Um, and so let me just explain this a little bit. Um, so the red one is Docker, and just ignore the like dark blue one. Um, and then you can see that Catalan containers and Nava containers have a little bit of overhead over here. Um, so that's we believe the reason for this drop in performance um, is because of a trick that color containers and uh, number containers have to do. Okay, um, this trick involves uh, that a standard CNI plugin provides a VEF pair, and because color containers and the Solo Five Unit Kernel interface expects a tab device. We do this really, really disgusting bridge trick. <laughs> Which, so basically, in the network, we have an additional hop. Um, so I think that's that's what we are we're thinking is attributing to this um, like ten percent loss here. So this blue one over here is without the loss. So there is still a little bit compared to um, well, depending on how much the the workload. Like this is pretty close. This one's uh, um, maybe about ten percent. Um, and then this is the difference between uh, having the additional network hop in the bridge. Yeah. Uh, so I also saw, uh, say Gvisor. So from my understanding, Gvisor also uh, do, uh, achieve the isolation by intercept uh, containers uh, system call and transmit to some limited system call. So I want to understand what's the difference okay. between Gvisor and Nabla. So I'm gonna give my my view or our team's view of this. Um, we we haven't um, again. This is our view, and I think there are people in the audience that can talk about Gvisor. Um, so so the based on the analysis, um, what we saw that so Nava's mission is very specific, right? Our core belief is that less is called means better. Okay. Um, so what we want to do is to reduce the number of syscalls. Now, Gvisor, we believe, has a different philosophy. So our belief, based on reading the code and playing around with it, is that the security is from two things. One is um, the functionality that used to be in the kernel is now in user space and is written in a safer language, one. Um, two is that there's segregation of different modules. So you get this, um, the security from the segregation and least privilege. Um, and that's where we believe um, the, the ideology is, but that's what we believe. Um, so I you know, can't really say much. So, so we basically, we looked at the, the the F trace results, and we saw that the F trace results weren't really hinting at this idea that you know it's. I can actually show you. So the, the F trace results weren't really hinting that they were doing exactly the same um, ideas as us. Given some of these are like P trace kernel function calls, so this experiment, like I said, is based on one metric, very subjective. Um, you know, we love to hear that. Philosophy. I mean, what what we say is just based on what we see. Yeah. Do you guys want to add something? Hello. I w I wanted to. Uh, oh, f it. Wait. I wanted to ask that is the customer can build the number image by themselves and run in public cloud. Uh, so sorry. Can you repeat that? Is the customer can build a Nabla image by themselves and then run in public cloud? Then, like the hypervisor? Then run in. Yeah. Yeah. Like, could they do this themselves? But I think they're missing the run in. Oh, yeah. So, um, the accessibility of this technology, do it themselves. It's open source. <laughs> Go download it, try it out. Okay. Um, 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, sorry. The cloud provider would have to give you oh. run and see unless you're talking about building your own. Yeah. Um, so de depending on your cloud provider, I can give you a, a hack into how you can do this, which your cloud provider probably wouldn't like, but it's doable. <laughs> um, yeah, but, but basically in terms of the code, the code's there, you can download, you can play with it. You can just use this as Docker just to play around with it. So it's, it's pluggable with run C and, and run SC, run V. Um, can you get the mic to Ian? I think he wanted to add on Gvisor. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so uh, thanks for the talk, it was interesting. Um, I, it's a very similar approach between Gvisor and Nabla. I think the idea of moving a lot of the kernel functionality into user space. Yes. Um, in terms of the philosophy, uh, I think the, the main philosophy of Gvisor is trying to focus on having a second security boundary everywhere. Okay. Um, and so, whereas it seems like uh, your, if I understood correctly, your focus is much more on reducing attack surface. Yes, yes. Um, right. So, yeah. you know, if you have two security boundaries <laughs> with very large attack surface, like how much does that really get you? So it's, it's yeah. I, I won't comment on which one is better, but uh, I, I, I mean, kind of what the difference is. We, we want to know if you, if you have an opinion on which one's better. <laughs> I mean, we, we can talk offline, obviously, but like, um, we really want to know what you guys think, and we just want to start the conversation so that you know we could be both right. So you create a combined matrix. <laughs> yeah, and and maybe there's there's room to kind of uh, combine yeah. some of these technologies. Uh, we 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 just started a line of research which is looking into um, uh, how we can segregate the library OS a bit more, especially with NetBSD because it's so modular. And the idea is we want to do something like IPC but not using IPC because it's heavyweight. So kind of like think about processes differently. So it's very kernel research kind of stuff, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so is there any proof of, proof of concepts to show that how secure number is, not only the number of syscalls it uses, but also when a tag are trying to exploring the kernel vulnerabilities, and mm -hmm. maybe Lambda survived and other containers just died. Are you talking about a very specific exploit? Or are you talking about exploits in general? I mean, you may, I mean, you may choose one of the, from CVE, right? Okay, you can just okay, use yeah, it. yeah. Um, so, so yeah, we've, we've looked into this and uh, we haven't played around that much with it. I mean, theoretically, we look at the exploit like Dirty Cow, and you know, it's trying to do M advice, which obviously it can't. Um, but I, I don't know whether, you know, it, it takes a significant amount of work to figure out whether the code paths that were triggered by M advice can be triggered elsewhere by either like writing memory really fast or something, we don't know. Um, but we do have a blog post we're writing. Um, there was a, don't give too many details. Uh, there's a, there was a bug in exe4 uh, with extended attributes that caused a denial of service on the host. Uh, we basically replicated that bug on Kata containers, but it wasn't possible on uh, Nabla and Gvisor because you guys blocked the extended attributes. <laughs> yeah, I hope that answers the question. Uh, we can talk later if it doesn't. Uh, hi, I, from a end user perspective, uh, okay. What are the main impact if we shift from Docker to Nabla? Because I think um, like if we are going to set up a port security policies and we can set up a, a stack home and capabilities and all the kind of uh, uh, security measures, security uh, ways. And from any user perspective, um, what, what we need to do and, uh, and um, like um, when do you forecast we can use Nabla in a very mature way, thank you. Yeah, so, so to, to just preface um, my answer that don't run this in production, um, it's not ready. <laughs> um, so with pod secure, so, so the idea is like, um, this provides some way to provide isolation between pods based on kernel attack surface. 
cloud security policy also, like if, if you take a look at, you know, we talk about DockerSecCom, right? You're reducing it a little bit, right? So if you have a way to quantify your risk and manage your risk that way, then, you know, um, for example, in the discussions we were having with isolation, right? If I really want, I had a super secret service and I had cash, I just buy a server and stick that one service on that and they'll be isolated. So part of our initial ideology was is that, you know, we are able, so if um, the use case was um, um, Juniper, Juniper notebooks or some kind of thing where people can run arbitrary code, right? If I can provide a high amount of isolation um, and have a really high density, then I can have good isolation with lower cost. Yeah. In terms of actually moving it into like the DevOps pipeline and to get it to do it, be done in production, um, we still have a bit of way to go in terms of removing the build process and things like that. Uh, oh, oh, we're out of time. So I, I'll stick around. So just come up and then we can chat. Thank you.